I want to jump into our top 10 series. We, we all know that the originator of top 10 lists uh, is not uh, billboard or, or uh, TV or radio programs. The original top 10 uh, person is God. God brought us the 10 commandments way back in Exodus and the Old Testament. Uh, God gave us a list of these, his, his top 10 list. And it's not just a list of, of to do's and to don'ts. It's not just a list of rules. We really truly believe, and this is what we've been kind of emphasizing in this, in this uh, series, is that there are really 10 principles that God has given us that if we live by these principles and put them into practice, they have the potential of truly connecting us vertically to God and connecting us correctly and well with the people around us. If you notice, the first four commandments are, are, are in relation to our connection with God vertically, and the, the last six commandments are in relation to how we live our lives with the people who are around us. And uh, it truly is, we, we've kind of established this, it's not about religion and it's all about relationship. Let's see if you can help me. It's not about religion and it's all about relationship. That's what God's word is about. That's what the Ten Commandments are about. Uh, what I'm saying, what I'm adding to every commandment is basically we're, we're giving it a principle. So rather than just saying commandment number one, uh, the commandment number one really is the principle of priority. So the first week we talked about the principle of priority. Commandment number one. What is commandment number one? Exodus 20 verse 3, which says, you must have no other gods but me. This is the principle of priority. Who do we worship? We worship God. Anybody else? No, we worship God only. Not only do we worship God only, but we put God first in first place in our lives. So when we give to God, we give him the first and we give him the best. We give him the first and the best. It's the principle of priority. The second week we talked about the second commandment, which, which we, we called the principle of purity. What is the second commandment? It's that commandment that says you must not make for yourself any idol or any kind of image of anything. Of anything in heaven, of anything on the earth, anything in the sea, you are not to make yourself any idol or image of anything, and you are definitely not to bow down and worship to them, right? And we talked that week about how there's consequences when we bring impurity, spiritually speaking, into our life by worshiping idols or praying to idols or lighting candles to idols. All these things that religion has sometimes taught us to do, they go against God's top ten list, okay? And there are also blessing for, blessings for those who honor God and only worship him and don't worship and honor idols, and that is goes even to the thousand generations. And so the first principle is the principle priority. Second commandment is the principle of purity. Last week, we talked about commandment number three, which is the principle of humility. The principle of humility. What was commandment number three? It's the one that says, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Another version says, you must not use the Lord's name in vain. And we talked last week about how sometimes we are, we are, um, not realizing that we can misuse God's name in the way we pray. We can misuse God's name in the way we prophesy or teach or preach. We can misuse God's name in the way we speak and talk. And sometimes God's name comes out when we're looking to curse or when we're looking to curse someone or something or even when we're upset or surprised and it has nothing to do with his goodness or his greatness. We're just throwing his name around as if he was just any other person or any other name. And so we talked about um, really honoring God when we speak. And the best way to proclaim his name is truly with praise and gratitude. If we're using God's name, we should be including it with praise and with gratitude. Now, <clears throat> that's going to lead us to today's commandment, which is commandment number four, and it's the principle of rest. If you have your worship guide, it's the principle of rest. And I was thinking about how to kind of introduce uh, today's message and topic to you. Um, this has happened to me a lot, and I don't know if it's happened to you guys. Has it ever happened to you that, 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 that you're in a season of life or you're, you're, you're going nonstop and you're so tired, and maybe even people tell you, hey, you look tired, and you're like, no, I'm fine. But you're exhausted? Has that ever happened to you? Like you, you, you almost, you, you self-convince con yourself that you're fine, but really you're not. You're burned out. You're exhausted. Has that ever happened to you? It happens to me uh, quite often, especially when I feel like I can keep going. In fact, has it ever happened to you that you're going so hard that all of a sudden you're driving and, and boop, you get one of those quick, has that ever happened to you? That's dangerous. That's scary, right? And then you start smacking your face and you start opening the window or you stop at the gas station, right, which is a very important thing to do. I have, I have a, a story about that which is too long and I can't go into, but, but when I was younger, not good, not good. You got to pay attention to the signs, right? Um, another thing that's funny to me is, is, is little kids are funny. I remember when I was a kid, I did it, but my kids do it now where, where they're like dying to stay awake, but they're tired. They're so tired and they're like, let me stay awake. I want to stay awake. And, and you're like, you're exhausted. You're tired. You need to go to bed. You need to go to sleep, right? And they're like, I'm not tired. Have you ever seen a little kid say, I'm not tired? And they start falling asleep while they're saying it, right? You know those America's Funniest Home videos where, where, where they're like, I don't, I don't want to go to sleep until 1 in the morning. And then all of a sudden you, the, the camera comes back and they're like faces in the mashed potatoes, right, in the, on, the, on their plate, right? H have you guys seen that? I, th I, think, 
I think it's funny because I think we all hit moments in life where we get tired. I think we all can fall in the trap of overestimating how much we can do without stopping. I think that it's, it's, it's quite common for us to underestimate the importance of rest and overestimate the importance of go, 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 go in today's culture, in today's life, and with our responsibilities. If you notice, most of the time when you ask somebody, hey, how's it going? A lot of times the response is, man, living, you know, struggling through what I'm going through. Or how's it going? Man, I'm trying to get through another day. How's it going? Man, I'm just surviving. You know, hey, how you doing today? Hey, you know, working hard. How you doing, man? I don't have enough time for the things I got to do. These are the common kind of responses. It's very rare to hear, hey, how's it going? Man, I'm completely rested. <laughs> I feel completely in peace in my soul, in my body, and in my mind, right? It's rare to hear that, right? It's rare. Hey, how's it going? Man, I, I don't know. What, I, can you give me something to do? Because I don't know what to do. It's very rare to hear that kind of response or even give that response in regards to how we're doing or, or what, we're, what we're going through. And so, and so I want to talk today about the principle of rest. And, and before we get into God's word, I want to take a moment and pray. Can we pray and ask God to speak to our hearts? You know, it's it's funny how much we receive or don't receive depending on how our heart is, right, when we're, when we're somewhere. And, and a seed is only as good as the soil in which it is planted. And, and so today I'm going to let go of some seeds from God's word. I believe it's good seed. Um, but particularly today, uh, I think it's a matter of how our, our soil is in our hearts and in our minds to receive God's word. Amen? Let's pray, Lord. I pray right now, Lord, that, that you would speak to us through your word. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Work in us, speak to us, speak through us. I pray that the seeds of truth of your word today, uh, that, they would be, that they would be planted, Lord, and they would fall in good soil in each heart, mind, and life of those of us who are here, present, and watching online. Lord, I pray that these seeds would grow, that they would give fruit, and they would flourish. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 I, I'll give this little kind of word of warning. I, th I think that, that sometimes... Um, you know, when God's word kind of hits a spot that's sensitive or that's touchy for us or that's tricky for us or even brings conviction because maybe we realize, man, I, I haven't been fulfilling what God wants me to do. Sometimes we can have an attitude of, well, what does a pastor know anyway, right? Or, you know, or does this really matter? Or, you know, uh, we're in 2019. And I really want you to have a mentality today of what's God's heart behind this principle? Amen. We're going to go over commandment number four or the fourth principle, the principle of rest. And you know what's interesting about this? This is the longest commandment. In, in other words, in terms of word, words in the commandment, you know, we find the commandments, ten commandments in two places, in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. And so in Exodus 20, uh, verse 8 which is where we're going to start. This is the commandment that has the most kind of words in it. And so God spends a little bit of time on this one. So um, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, buckle up your seatbelts. It's going to be a fun ride today. It says, remember to observe, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Another, another way of saying the Sabbath day is the day of rest, okay? Remember to observe the Sabbath day or day of rest by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. Okay, pause. I'm going to rewind. You have how many? Six days each week for what? For your ordinary work. For work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, so let's talk about that one day. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Okay. In essence, what the Word of God is teaching us here, and obviously we're talking about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about, you know, God speaking to Moses. Moses bringing the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel. We are God's people today. Basically what God is saying is six days you will work. Six days you will send your emails, have your meetings, comply with your job duties and responsibilities because that's your work. How many days? In six days you'll do that, okay? Um, and, and I, I want to make a little side note reminder. We don't keep the Ten Commandments to be saved, the Ten Commandments isn't what saved us. Saves us. Who saves us is Jesus Christ 
by grace and through the faith that we activate when we believe in who he is and what he's done for us. However, there are blessings if we keep the com- t- God's Ten Commandments, and there are consequences if we don't keep them. Can I get an amen? Okay. So, so we agree on the fact that the Ten Commandments, we don't keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. Okay, that's that's called religion. God is not a religious or a legalistic God. We we keep them because we know understand that they're principles that God's given us, and if we follow them, we can be blessed. There are blessings in following God's commandments, and there are consequences to not following them. Okay, so so here's my recommendation: don't follow eight of them and not follow two. Do you get what I'm saying? Don't, don't even follow nine and not follow one. My recommendation as a son of God, as a fellow brother in Christ, as a pastor of the church, I recommend follow all ten. Why do I say that? Don't, tell somebody close by, say, don't ignore one. Don't ignore one. Don't ignore one here. All right, so there's something about the fourth commandment that truly gets my attention because it seems like so many believers, and I'm not even talking about people who don't know God or people who kind of don't, don't read the Bible or go to church or kind of have a personal connection with God, but even in church, it seems like so many believers believe that we should keep nine of them, but aren't sure about this, ten, this, this one of the ten. <laughs> Think about this for a moment. Do we agree that all of us as believers, as those of us who are Christian believers, we believe that we should have no other God before, uh, except for God? Do we believe that? Do we agree? All right. If, if you agree with me, just give me a little hand up. Okay. Do we agree that we, should, that we should not have any idols or worship or bow down to idols? Okay, great. Do we believe that we should not misuse God's name or use it in vain? We believe that? All right. I'm going to skip the fourth. Let's go to the fifth one. Do we believe that we should honor our father and our mother? We should honor them? Yes? Okay, great. Do we believe that we should not lie? We believe we shouldn't lie, right? Do we believe that we should not steal? We believe that we should not steal. Do we believe that we should not murder? All right. Get those hands up. Uh, do we believe... Do we believe that we should not commit adultery, right? We should not commit adultery. And lastly, do we believe that we should not covet, covet things that aren't ours? We, should, we, believe, we all agree with that, right? We, we, do we all agree with that? We all agree with that. So why do we think that we don't need to keep commandment number four? Why do we think that it's okay for us to work seven days and not take a day to rest? I strongly believe that We need to pay attention to this principle from God's word in our lives because God's intention has always been to bless us and to care for us by giving us the gift of the day of rest. And and, and, and it's interesting as I taught because I sat in the seat in the past where I, I didn't get this and I didn't see what was a blessing and a gift. I saw it as like a restriction and a limitation of what I want to do instead of seeing God knows better than me. So I want to talk about three main points today. Um, point number one is going to have two sub points. So point number one, I want you to fill that on your worship guide with me. There are reasons that God said to rest, okay? There are reasons. This is not just like, oh, pastor, just want to talk about something random or, you know, God doesn't know what he's talking about. Like, no, there are reasons God said to rest. All right, sub point, num- uh, letter A, I want you to fill it in with me. First of all, it gives God the opportunity to provide for us supernaturally. Now, we have a supernatural God. And I believe that he works supernaturally. And it give, this gives God the opportunity to provide for us supernaturally. When we don't work seven days a week and we actually follow his principle, he can supernaturally provide for us. How so? Let's look at the example in Exodus, right? You guys remember when the people of Israel were out in the desert and God supernaturally provided manna for them from, from the sky, from heaven? You guys remember that? Let, let's take a look at this. Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. And so Moses is talking to the people of Israel and it says, he told them, This is what the Lord commanded. So the Lord commands this. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest. In other words, tomorrow is the Sabbath. It's a day of rest. A holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So this is is the instruction. So today, since it's the sixth day, bake or boil as much as you want today and set aside what is left for tomorrow. So they put some aside. In other words, they got extra on the sixth day. They put some aside until morning, just as Moses had commanded. And in the morning, the leftover food was wholesome and good without maggots or odor. Okay, pause there. Okay? So, so remember something. If you don't remember the story, you can read it throughout the week. But, but what happened is when they first started receiving the manna, remember they're, they're in the desert. They're like, what are we going to have to eat? God supernaturally responds as he always did and starts providing this manna from heaven. When they first started receiving the manna, God said, only gather. So for the first five days, God says, only gather what you need for today. 
God's instruction on, on the first five days is gather what you need for one day. Now, why did God say this? Because God knew that he was going to provide daily on a daily basis for them. Many of the people didn't, didn't trust God completely, and they worried, what if there's no manna tomorrow? So what did many people try to do? They tried to, on day one and two and three, they tried to gather extra manna, more than the one day, and what happened the next morning when they woke up? It spoiled, it, it, it rotted, it, it was no good. There were maggots, there were worms. And, and, and it, it was kind of a statement from God saying, oh, you think you know more than me. You think you can gather more. You, you think that's actually going to be a provision. Well, actually, no, follow my instructions. But, but interestingly enough, what God's instruction is for the five days is different on day six. Because on day six, he says, on day six, specifically and only, you can gather enough for that day and gather some extra for the next day. Because on the next day, since it's the day of the rest, of rest you shouldn't be working to do this. Okay? Verse 25. Exodus 16, 25. Moses said, eat this food today, for today is a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. Which, by the way, is something important on your day of rest. You should dedicate it to the Lord. There will be no food on the ground today. What does it say? There will be no food on the ground. When? Today. So, it says there will be no food on the ground today. What this means is that God's not going to provide even if you work on that seventh day for that work on that seventh day. At least he's not. The supernatural provision of God. In God's economy, which sometimes we don't understand, his provision. You might be able to gather some of your own provision or something that's not of God, but God is making it clear. Okay, he says, you're not going to find my provision on the seventh day because I will provide enough on the sixth day if you are faithful and follow a principle. But if you try to work on the seventh day, it, you will not find my, that provision will not be from me. There will be no food on the ground today, speaking on the day of the Sabbath. You can send all the emails you want. You can have the meetings that you want. You can do all of your job duties and responsibilities and get ahead or do a little extra. You can do that. But provision from me is not coming on that day or for that work. Verse 26, you may gather the food for six days. Just in case it hasn't been clear yet, he's kind of reiterating. But the seventh day is the Sabbath. There will be, how much? No food on the ground that day. Some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day. <laughs> Not much different than it would be today, right? That's how the human, we as human beings are, are so, sometimes we don't, we don't get it, right? Some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day, but they found no food, just like God said. The Lord asked Moses, how long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? He's getting frustrated. They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's, what, what, what? Gift. What is the Sabbath? It's the Lord's gift to you. That is why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day, so there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. Do not go out to pick up food on the seventh day so that people did not gather any food on the seventh day. Okay, so, so think, about, think about it this way. Like, like if we put it nowadays, verse 27 would be like, some of the people went out anyway and started sending emails, had their meetings, and did their job duties on the seventh day. But they found no provision from God for working on that day specifically. From God. Now, Remember, the Ten Commandments are in Exodus 20, but they're also in Deuteronomy chapter 5. It's funny because in Deuteronomy chapter 5, there's actually an extra little portion. There's an extra line that's not in Exodus 20 regarding this commandment. And I want us to look at it up on the screens because you don't have it in your guide. Um, Deuteronomy 5.15. Look what it says in Deuteronomy 5.15. It says, remember that you were once what? You were once slaves in Egypt. So God is reminding them, you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to what? To rest on the Sabbath day. And why, why is Moses reminding them this? And why did God want Moses to remind them this? Is because, remember something, slaves in that, in that time, slaves didn't get a day off. In those times when, when, when the people of Israel were in Egypt, the slaves, they didn't get a day off. The only ones who got a day off were, were the, the, the royalty, the, the sons of uh, the family of the king, the, the royalty of, of, of Israel, um, the people who maybe were of, of uh, the elite or the wealthy, you know, that were in that category. And now God is saying through Moses to the people of Israel, you are my children. I am ki the king of kings and lord of lords. You are the son of almighty king. I am giving you a gift that you haven't had for a long time because you were slaves for a long time. And my gift to you is a day of rest. It's a Sabbath. 
think about it this way nowadays, and, and I know it, it might sound extreme, but think about it this way. All of us who work, we're slaves to our meetings every week. We're slaves to the jobs that have to get done. We are slaves to the duties that we have to accomplish. We're slaves to the emails. We're slaves to the, to the responsibilities that we have because we have to do them. We, we have to, if we want the, the business to go well, if we want our work to go, if we want to keep a job, we have to do these things, right? We, we're committed. But there's something about honoring God with a day of rest, with the Sabbath. It's all throughout Scripture. God is giving us a day. He's providing for us. He's taking care of us. All throughout Scripture, God is trying to give us a day off. It's kind of like when, you know, you know like, you know, like, you know, your, your little kid, you know, your little four-year-old who wants to stay up all night. I'm not tired. I'm not tired. Boom. Hand in the mouth. Face in the mashed potatoes, right? And sometimes I think that's who we, that's, you know, God, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need this. Like, God, this is for people who maybe are, are weak and boom. And, we're, and our heads are falling right in the mashed potatoes. You know, honestly, this is one of those principles that, that just how God works so different than us. It's kind of like tithing. It's kind of like tithing because... God can do more with 90% than you and I can do with 100%. And in the same way, God can do more in six days than you and I can do in seven days without stopping. I don't know how it works. I, honestly, my, my human um, uh, intellect, doesn't, it doesn't add up. For us, seven days of work equals more work. That's what for us, humanly speaking, for God, six days equals more with a day of rest. How much can you do in six days? Well, God created the whole world in six days. And interesting enough, interestingly enough, he know he didn't need to. He took one day as a model for us to follow because he knew we would need it. You know, it's funny. Um, this is an example I think many of us maybe have, maybe have heard about. But it, uh, if you kind of look at the studies and, and, and some interesting facts, most fast food restaurants are open seven days a week. Most fast food restaurants are open seven days a week. And many of them are actually open 24 hours a day, Right? We, we know a lot of these fast food restaurants. And here's an interesting thing. There's a fast food restaurant that stands apart from all the other. And there's one, Christian Chicken, right? <laughs> Chick-fil-A stands apart from all the other, most of the other fast food restaurants in that they are open six days a week. And if I get you a little hungry, um, I don't want to lead you on because today they're going to be closed if you go, okay? <laughs> they're open six days a week, okay? They don't open on Sundays. Do you want to know why they don't open on Sundays? They have it in their bylaws and in their rules when anybody could jump on. The reason they don't work on Sundays is they, they specifically state to give our employees a day of rest and worship. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing. Somebody give him a Chick-fil-A gift card. Um, <laughs> here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing. The other fast food chains and restaurants and franchises, they're open seven days a week. A lot of them are 24 hours. By the way, m all the other, like all the fast food chains, they're most productive day financially are Sundays. So all the other ones. Sunday's the most productive day, okay? The average fast food restaurant grosses about a million dollars a year. And average because some more and some less, but the average of all the other franchises of fast food restaurants, they gross about a million dollars a year. Chick-fil-A, without being open seven days a week, without being open 24 hours a day, grosses about, on average, about five million per year. So, so... Five times as much as the others not working on one of the days. I'm just using it as an example. Like them, there are many. There are business owners here that do similar things. There are restaurant owners here that do similar things. And uh, I've heard the same thing about Hobby Lobby. I think that's another place that also does things. Because there's Christian values. And people get frustrated when they go to the door and they're like, they're not open today. But their people are getting rest and many of them are worshiping. And then you wonder, man, is there a connection here? Is there a connection so a good reason to rest is because it gives God the opportunity to provide for you supernaturally. B, letter B, it gives us the opportunity to rest and be refreshed. Can you guys say the word refreshed? refreshed. It's, it's even refreshing to say refreshed. Refreshed. We don't say it often enough, right? Look at Exodus 31. Exodus 31, verse 14. It seems like this is important to God. It says, you must keep the Sabbath day. For it is a holy day for you. You see, you see, not only is it just a day of rest, but it's actually a holy day. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Now, this is the law. We're, we're, we're obviously living in the grace now, praise God, because there, a lot of you wouldn't be here right now, right? 
A lot of us wouldn't be here if, if things were still like this. But, but check it out. It says, anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Anyone who works on that day will be cut off from the community. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day must be a Sabbath day of complete rest, a holy day dedicated to the Lord. Anyone who works on the Sabbath must be put to death. The people of Israel must keep the Sabbath day by observing it from generation to generation. This is a covenant obligation for when? For all time, it is a permanent sign of my covenant with the people of Israel. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day, he stopped working and was. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day, he stopped working and was refreshed. Isn't that interesting? This is interesting. How could God, who is almighty, God who never sleeps, never tires, never grows weary, how could he be refreshed? In, in the original Hebrew writings of, of, of the scripture here, um, <clears throat> it says, and God took breath. Or God breathed in. What was he doing on the first six days? He was creating through his word. And think about when you speak, you're speaking out. But on day six, he breathed in. On day six, he was refreshed. For six days, he had been breathing out. On the seventh, he breathed in. I have a question. If God refreshes himself and can be refreshed, should that not be a sign for us? The day of rest should be a full day. Not half a day, not a couple of hours. It should be a full day. And it's a good thing. Point number two. I'm going to blow you out of the water with this one. There are consequences when we don't rest. <laughs> there are consequences. Why is this matter important? Because there are consequences when we don't rest. Again, can we all give glory to God? Thank God that Jesus changes everything. Amen. Jesus brought us into the, into the, into the, uh, um, the covenant of grace. And we're, not, we're no longer in the covenant of law. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that Jesus did not come to abolish the law. He came to live it out and fulfill it. Amen. And, and so the, interest, the good thing is that it's not that we no longer have to do things. It, but the, the good thing is that Jesus, Jesus changes everything. But I want you to take, see how serious this is. Numbers 15. How serious God took this from the beginning. Numbers 15 verse 32. Look what it says. It says, one day while the people of Israel were in the wilderness, they discovered a man gathering wood on the Sabbath day. What a horrible thing, right? Gathering wood. It sounds like something normal to us. Verse 33, the people who found him doing this took him before Moses, Aaron, and the rest of the community. They held him in custody because they did not know what to do with him. For doing what? For gathering wood? Then the Lord said to Moses, the man must be put to death. You guys get it now. Why? He, why? It's not the fact that he was gathering wood. It's that he was doing work that he wasn't supposed to be doing on the day of rest. The whole community must stone him outside the camp. Verse 36. The, so the whole community took the man outside the camp and stoned him to death just as the Lord had said. It's a strong word, right? Now, obviously, we're talking about the times of the law. God definitely takes this seriously. They find a man gathering wood, not murdering somebody, not committing adultery, and, and it seems kind of funny to us, but they held him in custody for gathering wood. What did this guy do? He was gathering wood on the Sabbath. Severe consequence. Do you guys know that in, 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 that in the time of the law, there were four things that required the death penalty in the Old Testament law? Four things that required the death, te the death penalty according to the ceremonial law. Uh, murder. Somebody who murdered re required a death penalty. Somebody who committed adultery received the death penalty. Check this one out. Rebellious children. <laughs> so if your kids are giving you a hard time, be like, you're lucky you're in the New Testament, brother. <laughs> and third, not, and fourth, not keeping the Sabbath day holy. Not keeping the day of rest. And you might wonder, why would not keeping the Sabbath day be on the same level as murder and adultery and all these things? Remember that each commandment has a principle behind it. And I want you to consider this. Could it be that not resting is actually killing us ourselves physically, little by little? Could it be that many people that we might know or in the news have been passing away prematurely 
for reasons that really, if we could come down to it, probably were unnecessary? Could it be that sometimes there's damage happening to ourselves for not following and keeping this principle of the Lord? There are consequences. There are consequences. And we see it in God's word throughout. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, I want, I want you to see something. This is, this is when the people of Israel were taken captive out of their land for 70 years. I don't know if you guys remember the story. They were taken captive in Babylon. 2 Chronicles 36 verse 20. Look what it says. It says, the few who survived were taken as exiles to Babylon, and they became servants to the king and his sons until the king of Persia came to power. Look at the next verse. Verse 21, it says, so the message of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. Check this out. The land finally enjoyed what? Its Sabbath rest. What enjoyed its Sabbath rest? The land finally enjoyed its Sabbath rest, lying desolate until the 70 years were fulfilled, just as the prophet had said. Now, now I, I want to give a little bit of backstory here to kind of understand what it's, let me explain what happened. So in those times, God had given a very important um, instruction or command to the people of Israel. And what they were commanded to do, they were specifically commanded to every seven years give the land a Sabbath rest for a year. In other words, the people of Israel could work the land as farmers. They could work the land, but every seven years they had to give it a year of rest or a Sabbath rest. Rest, and we're talking about we're talking about the land here, giving it a rest. Now it seems like it seems like God in heaven was taking note every seven years, marking that's one Sabbath. Because what happened is the people of Israel start started not complying with this command. In other words, they started they they started to work seven years, didn't give the land its Sabbath rest, and continued working seven years and continued working, never giving the land rest. And the interesting thing about it is we understand that the people of Israel were kept in exile, they were kept kept in ex they were in exile, taken captives in Babylon for 70 years. Now here's the interesting part. When we look and we study the word, we see you want to know how long the people of Israel went? Without giving the land rest, 490 years. The people of Israel went 490 years without giving their la the land rest on the Sabbath year as the Lord had commanded. Now, like I said, it seems to me as if God was marking it down every year. That's seven, that's one. And would you not also think, hey, we're getting away with it after year 40 or 50 or 100 and 150? We're getting away with it. Nothing's really happening. They're, you know, why keep, you know, we're okay. When you go a certain amount of time and you haven't seen any significant consequences, you might think or come to believe that you're getting away with it. But we see what happened. The people of Israel were in exile, captured by Babylon for how many years? 70 years. Which if you do the math, those of you who are good at math, one year for every seven years that was not taken accounted for of a year of rest. And after that, released. There are consequences when we don't rest. There are consequences. Remember, there's a principle behind each commandment. And consider, are you hurting yourself, putting yourself closer to death every week <laughs> by not resting appropriately, by not resting appropriately? It's evident that the people of Israel didn't get away with it. And I think for many people, sometimes it catches up. Sometimes as the years are going, you feel young, you feel strong, and little by little, you start realizing and seeing how maybe some things are catching up from the past. If God is concerned about the land, can I ask you a question? Is he not concerned about you and me? If he's concerned about the land, is he not concerned about us? There are consequences. And I believe some people are suffering some consequences because they're not following the principles that God has given. God has given us a gift, and it is a day of rest. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. You know, 
in 2014, um, about, about five months, four or five months before uh, my wife and I relaunched vertical, our church as Vertical Church before kind of entering this new season, which was a very, probably the, the, the hardest um, big, kind of big impact season in, in our lives, you know, to this point. And I got a call. I got a call from a friend who called me and he said, hey, hey, Verge, you know, I, we want to see if you and your wife can, can join us on a retreat over here close to Dallas in Texas. We want to we uh, do like a marriage retreat for you. And we're inviting other, some of the other um, Spanish Christian worshipers or, you know, people that, people that we know are blessing Latin America. Our pastor just wants to bless some Hispanic ministers throughout, throughout the states. And if you could come, uh, just give us a week. All you got to do is get here and we'll cover you for a week. Of course, you know, praise God for sure. And so there was some, there was some other Spanish Christian artists, Marco Barrientos and his wife, and Funky and his wife were there. Um, you know, Jacobo Ramos, Coalo Zamorano, Marcela Gandara, Lily Goodman, some great, great friends and, and, and fellow co-workers in the Spanish um, worship ministry. And so we went, and, and here's what they said to us. The first day we got there, they sat us down and they said, here's the only rules. It's, it's, a, it's a church called Gateway Church, and they just love blessing people. And Pastor Robert Morris has a very important message on rest. And, and so he, they said, this is the rule. Every time we have a meal, all we ask is that, is that, you, that after the meal, we have a, about a 30-minute teaching or lesson that we want to share with you. And we were like, okay, great. The rest of the time, you have free time. You can use all of the campus. It was like, I don't know, 100 acres of the land and things to do. And, and so we were like, wow, this is amazing. We were all looking at ourselves like, why did they bring us? And this is great. And every teaching, every teaching was about rest. Every teaching they gave us, every teaching they gave us was about the importance of rest. And I remember that that impacted me so much because I believe God was caring for me and my wife and preparing us for the season that we were about to enter because he knew what we were going to have to face. We were already facing and what we would have to face. And what happened is the Lord, you know, my initial instinct is kind of like, there's so much to do. It's impossible to get everything done if I don't work all seven days. And God taught me a very important principle on that retreat, which, which, which there I think is when it came real for us. And my wife and I took it so seriously that we do not mess with or play with our day of rest. And I think it was God caring for me, teaching me. Like I think today is God caring for some of us today that maybe haven't heard this message or maybe have ignored this message. I believe with all my heart. I believe that if I would have kept the pace that I was keeping, it would have been trouble for me eventually would have caught up. Point number three. There are blessings when we rest. There are blessings when we rest. Look at Mark chapter 2. This is now, now New Testament. This is Jesus. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. Let's read. It says, One Sabbath... As Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. And it says, but the Pharisees said to Jesus, look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God during the days when Abiathar was high priest and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests were allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, check out Jesus' words. This is Jesus. The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Okay, so, so why is this important, Pastor Verge? I want to I wanna just emphasize that we do not have a legalistic God. God is not all about being legalistic and ritualistic and religiosity. No, no, no. Um, this is Jesus himself. And Jesus says, hey, 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 we created, we created, we didn't create man for the Sabbath. We created Sabbath as a gift for man. Do you realize that God could have created a six-day six week? He could have created in six days and just started right all over right, right again. Boom. But he didn't. He incorporated a day of rest. That seventh day, that Sabbath day, that day of rest has always been God's idea. The Sabbath is God's gift to you. You know, there's a famous saying that says, uh, more than Israel has kept the Sabbath, Sabbath has kept Israel. (laughs) 
Again, this is a principle. I believe with all my heart this is a principle, not to be held like a legalistic rule. Why do I say that? Because there are some religions and denominations who impose on legalistic uh, imposition of this rule, and they say the only way to worship God is only on this day, and it has to be like this. Be careful with that. That's religiosity. God's heart is understanding that we need a day of rest in our seven days, and, and this can vary. It can look different. For a lot of people, Sundays is the day of rest. For a lot of people, that's kind of the norm. I'll tell you one thing for me. For me, Sunday is not my day of rest. Sunday is my biggest day of work. For me, what, what, this season, for me, me and my wife, Monday is our day of rest. So on Mondays, I don't do anything that has to do with work. As hard as it is for my wife and I not to talk about church, because you want to know we were, always, we're always talking about you. <laughs> we're always talking about church. And we have to intentionally force ourselves on Mondays. We're not going to do work. We're not, we're, and, 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 and so it's not an issue of I'm going to go, you know, point the finger at those who don't do it on, on the seventh day. Be careful with, with sometimes these Religious types of impositions. However, there is a, there's a principle that we, do, we must honor God with a day of rest. There's a question that almost everybody asks because when they start talking about the day of rest, they're kind of curious. So, pastor, pastor, so what do you do on the day of rest? And, and here's what I say. That's the wrong question to ask. If you really want to get to the bottom of the whole day of rest thing, the wrong question is what do you do? The right question is what do you not do on the day of rest? That's what it's all about. Now, the right answer to that question is you don't do anything having to do with work. Somebody told me one day, oh, Pastor, but you can't go play basketball on your day of rest because you're, you're doing energy. No, no, it's not, that's not what it's about. Energy, refu basketball refuels me. I finished playing basketball. Yeah, I'm tired physically, but I am, my soul is, is, is alive and it's refreshed because I'm not working. And, and, and it's a, we make the Sabbath day holy. In other words, God is invited. That's why Sunday is a convenient day to be the day of rest because you come to church. Man, God is in the middle of my Sabbath, my rest. And, and, and throughout the whole day, I'm, 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 he's in my mind and I'm honoring him and I'm worshiping him. But on my day of rest, I'm not working. I'm honoring God and I'm, and I'm breathing in. You know, I'll close off with this. I think some people sometimes... Sometimes we don't get it. And I'm going to use an example that might sound a little crude, but, but I just want to make my point. Sometimes you got to give a strong example to make your point. Um, you know, with regards to the Ten Commandments, you know, JC, JC, you would never ask me on Monday, you would never ask me on Monday, hey, let's go steal something. Right? JC would never do that. JC would never do that. Adrian, you never come to me on Monday on my day of rest, and you, or on any day for that matter, you wouldn't come to me and say, hey, you know, let's go commit adultery. You wouldn't call, ask me to do that. None of you would on any day. Yet some people might be inclined, knowing maybe my day of rest or anybody's day of rest, come and say, hey, hey, just let's do this. Let's work. If I would never ask you to commit adultery, to lie, to bow down before idols, why would I ask you to work on your day of rest? You think, Pastor, do you have to go that far? I'm just speaking what I believe God's spirit has asked me to share today with us. There was a season of my life when I was going nonstop. I was working per diem as a therapist at Jackson North Medical Center and in a private pediatric clinic as, a, as an occupational therapist. I was traveling with Contagious two to two or three weekends a month. My wife is having babies. I'm serving as a worship leader here at church, supporting my dad and preaching whenever in town. And it was nonstop. I was working seven days, seven days nonstop. I was working seven days. If I would have kept that pace in these last years, especially with the responsibility God's given me now, I always ask myself, Seeing people working as a therapist in the hospital, seeing people having strokes at 40 and helping them do therapy to kind of recover and rehabilitate. Seeing people with all kinds of problems, 50 years old and, 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 and myo myocardial infarctions and, and heart attacks and all kinds of things. And I'm asking myself, could it be that there's a connection that it caught up? as human beings, we think we're getting away with it because we're okay today. Look how strong I am. Look how I got it. And all of a sudden, 
just like that. I remember doing therapy with a guy, Venezuelan guy, 38 years old, a physical trainer. And I'm sitting in there doing therapy because his whole right side was, was paralyzed from his stroke. And he would tell me in Spanish, he would tell me, I don't know what happened. I wonder. I wonder if it would just, now I'm not saying that, that when we keep God's principles, we don't have unexpected situations or, or you know, things might not happen because we live in an imperfect world. Praise God that, that our hope is not here, our hope is in heaven, right? But, 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 but while we're here, are we being good stewards of our bodies, of our lives? You know, you know what I came to understand? I came to understand this. Pastor, you so, so I owe God days of rest? Listen, you don't owe God. You owe you. I think that's what he would say. If I said to him, God, so I owe you days of rest? He'd be like, no, son, you owe yourself. It's a gift that I've given you, but you haven't been willing to take it and receive it or believe in it or trust me. You've been going out to the fields looking for manna on the seventh day. If you found provision, it hasn't been for me. Close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment. If you're not in the habit of taking a day of rest, maybe it's because nobody ever taught you. Maybe you never saw the importance of it from God's word. Or maybe you've heard it, but you just haven't really believed it. Maybe you just, maybe I just don't trust God enough to believe that six days of work will be enough. By the way, if you have the opposite and you work one day and rest six days, that's another problem. That's another message. So what is the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message today? Some questions to consider. Are you practicing this principle of keeping the Sabbath day holy? Or are you breaking it? It's either one or the other. Is your health physically suffering from burnout? Are there symptoms and signs that you need to pay attention to? Are your relationships suffering and maybe there's a connection because of your nonstop patterns, your marriage has been struggling. Because you justify, I'm working hard to provide for my kids, but your kids have no time with you. Maybe they could, maybe they could care less about those extra couple hundred bucks because of an extra day of work and actually would appreciate a couple hours of FaceTime with you. Is today a gift from God? Because maybe it seems like a restriction and a limitation and an imposition, but really it's just God trying to give me a gift that I haven't been willing to accept. I want to pray over you right now. Lord, I pray that every man, woman, and young person here at Vertical Church and watching online, I include myself, Lord, that we would have a teachable heart in this matter. That we would choose to honor you by keeping the day of rest every week working hard six days but resting and being refreshed and making it holy keeping you in first place on this day I pray that you would teach us so that we would save ourselves Lord from burnout physically from burnout emotionally from spiritual weakness. I pray, Lord, that you would help us put these principles in practice as a model and example for our young ones who are watching every move we make because when they get older, they might follow the same workaholic patterns. They might follow the same go, 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 seven days a week, 24 hours a day patterns. And not only would it affect us, but it might affect them. And so I pray, Lord, that you would give us the sensibility to be attentive to your word, obedient to your word. Give us rest, Lord, and teach us rest. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.